when Cliff comes back, he's getting to this pretty deep. I want to hear the rest of this. And so I know this is coming. So it's easier just to say, hey, you know, what I want to teach, I want to teach from a higher level. I'm, we're going to still dive into things because I really truly believe in the Word of God and the Word of God just speaks no matter what. But, you know, I, you know, I'm not going to dive deep into every little nook and cranny about each of the verses. But I love, I mean, I, and it was kind of funny because how we got started in Genesis, and then God ain't even showing up anymore, but there was a young guy here, and the first thing he mentioned was, I, don't, I read Genesis and I don't get nothing out of it. And I'm kind of like, oh my gosh. Oh my you know, there, there's favorite books of mine. You know, <clears throat> James, without shadow of a doubt, is one of my favorite books. The Gospel of John is one of my favorite books. Revelation is a book I love to study. I don't fully understand it still, but it's one of the other stuff. Genesis, to me, is a movie. You know, it's just unreal. What's, I mean, it's, it's, it's not really difficult just to read it like a book. And another one, when you read that, and when you read, when you read Genesis, it just kind of like, really, Lord? <laughs> this is how things got started. And, you know, why did you not bring Jesus back sooner than, than now? But, you know, it was just like, oh, my gosh. But it sets, it, as Genesis said, it is the beginning. And it sets the tone. And, and, and the one thing, you know, and, and, and over the years of, of being a believer, and I never went to seminary either, so I'm like Cliff. I never went to seminary. I went to, I went to a Christian school. I wish now, you know, especially studying the Old Testament, I wish now I had paid more attention to my Old Testament professor because I got C's on that barely. And, um, and now looking back at it, I love reading the Old Testament. Um, you know, some people just, just stay in the New Testament. But if you honestly want to fully understand the New Testament, you have got to go back to the Old Testament. Because there's, I mean, you know, every time, like, you know, what, what's the gospel verse that um, um, that's, um, Cliff keeps talking about? 1 Corinthians 15, 1. 1 through 4, right? And it said, and, and, and the key piece in that verse is, as he's talking about, you know, you know, Christ died according to Scripture. He was raised, again, according to Scripture. And the whole thing, the, 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 that's the little piece of that whole thing. Well, that's the gospel message. The peace in that thing, according to Scripture. What Scripture? It wasn't the New Testament. It was the Old Testament. And so when you sit there and you look at that gospel message in, first, in, in Corinthians, and, you know, and it says, according to Scripture, you have to realize, you really have to see the rest of the story, or know the rest of the story, to fully understand that whole gospel message. Because it is according, and it's a key word, there, according to Scripture, because God's Word is always true all the way through. And so when we sit there, and, and just as we, you know, oh, like I said, I'm not going to get into this, but he's, um, Cliff is going through what they call dispensationalism, a well, timeline. Okay, and a dispensational timeline is just a set of timelines in different periods of the Bible history. And so and what's interesting is that, if, and especially if you read Genesis and then you go and read Revelation, it's like, wow, I love doing those two together. Because, you know, you're reading the very end, I mean the very beginning, and you're reading the very end. And if you know the stuff in the middle, it's kind of wild. Somebody, you know, ask, somebody asked a question. What is the knowledge of God like? I was thinking about this. How many people have seen Endgame? Anybody here? The movie? God, remember that? Okay. All right. I don't know, maybe this one. Okay. But still, Endgame is the Marvel movies. Okay. And Marvel movie has took, you know, what, 15, 20 movies to come up to where they came up with a final climax of all those movies. I'm trying to think of another movie. Anybody see a series, any, any type of series movies? Yeah, like, like Avengers um, or something? Yeah. Something like that? Yeah. That Did you see the event, the end game? Well, I took my son, yeah. Just, okay, but still, here's the key thing. If you walk into any, if you walk into a movie, let's forget um, a series like that. If you walk into any movie, you're going in, and you if you might have read a book, and me, I don't read books, you know, to be to before I go see a movie. I just want to go see the movie. That's why I, you know, so I just come to relax, really. But you know, you go into it and you think about, it. you go to the movie, you really don't know what the end's gonna be like, especially if it's a really good movie. But then you walk out and you go, hey, I saw the beginning and I saw the end. And if it's a really good movie that's power packed and everything else, you may have to go back two or three times just to really capture everything, right? Here's God. 
God is the one that wrote the storyline to the movie, thought about before it, it ever came into film, sat and directed it, knows the very end. You know? So you want to think about the knowledge of God, you gotta think about that that he's the person that created all this stuff, that created the storyline and everything else, and he knows the very all at the same time. He, you know, if you've gone to a movie, um, I'm a big fan of um Cahill, U.S. Marshal, John Wayne. I love John Wayne. Anybody seen that one? Do we have, do we have some? Good. You know, <laughs> I can watch that movie. I know what's going to happen at the beginning and the end because of what? I've seen it, right? I don't mind rewatching it. But see, you got to think about God. God mm -hmm. sees the whole picture. He wrote it. He knows the very end. He even knows what's really going to happen after what's not written in, in, in Revelation, after that new earth and new heaven. You know, all that's been seen. God has all that knowledge. And yet, he chooses to interact in the different parts of that big, huge storyline. And that's what, in, in the Bible, and in, in, in I love how Genesis starts, in the Bible, it is a, it is a storyline of God's love, God's patience, and in, including God's love, it's God's judgment. Because you got to understand, without true love, you can't have, or you can't have judgment if you don't, true judgment if you don't have love. In other words, what I'm saying is that it's out of God's love that there's judgment. And we got, and, and you know, you refer back to being a parent. Why do we discipline our children? That's not, that's not, you know. And sometimes our discipline can be seem like to a child is pretty much severe judgment. You know, I've known some families that have gone through some difficult times, and they, and and unfortunately, it's been done to me, but not because they were Christians. But I, I've known some Christian parents that made a decision, not that they don't love their child, but they allow their child to go to prison or jail. They allow their child to say, "Okay, you're not living in this house as long as you're doing this." Period. You know, and that's a tough decision. Now that's not that, and for uh, and the ones I know of, that was not out of hatred towards that child. That was putting down a severe penalty to that child because out of love, because they realized that hey, you're still doing things that are disrespectful. And so when you read Genesis, and as we get ready to go into chapter three, you got to understand that hey. There was an opportunity, in, 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 and we're going to look at that. We're going to look at Genesis chapter three, and then if we have time, and um, let me uh, make sure I do see them, because this is powerful. If we have time, I want us to look at Revelations chapter twenty-one and twenty-two, because you'll see how the new heaven and the new earth that's described in Revelation, there is no death, there is no sin coming into that in Genesis. Even though God had created the Garden of Eden, there was the opportunity for death. There was the opportunity to sin. There was the opportunity not to do any of that. And we'll, and we'll start to look at that. But it's, it's really neat, you know, because you can see how, hey, the new heaven and the new earth and, 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 and the new Jerusalem that you read in Revelation at the end of the Revelation, it's very much... Like what we see here as far as in the creation of the earth and everything else, except it is totally final. You know, and so all the things that are happening between now or between that point in time up to the point in time whenever that's going to happen, you know, is dealing with God's love, but also God's judgment. And so let's look, and so you know, I want to just kind of recap. First of all, we started off in Genesis chapter 1, and, I, you know, and some of the things I want to kind of highlight was, first of all, God created the heavens and the earth. You go to Genesis chapter 1, um, Revelation chapter 21, it's going to say that God created a new heaven and a new earth. So, you know, John 14 is another one of those scriptures that gets uh, mentioned a lot in funerals. Unfortunately, I had to go to a funeral this weekend. But, you know, in my house is many mansions, and I go to prepare a place for you. And I tell you this because I'm coming back. You know, you hear that all the time. But still, it is really the truth. You know, it's not just, I mean, I hate that it's always used around funerals and stuff like that, but it's a powerful truth. God is preparing a place for us. 
And as, we get, and as you go into Revelation and you see the final result, what it's going to be, it mirrors a lot of what, the, of what um, happens here in the first part, two chapters of Genesis. The key piece of it is that all the things that corrupted the Garden of Eden is no longer there for the new heaven and new earth. So I love this how it says that God created it. And, and the thing is, it's God, the triune God. You know, I mean, John, or First John 1 says what? In the beginning was the Word, the word and the Word was God. with God, and the Word was God. He was, he was part of everything in creation. Paul writes this also in Colossians. Without, without Christ, everything was created through Christ. Because why is through Christ? Because both God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit is one God. We're not taught three separate entities or personalities or, or, or characteristics, but yet there's still just one God. And God is not a body. God is a spirit. And as we talked about, you know, it's just as, it just in, as in Psalm 139, when David writes, he says, How far can I go? To escape your presence. And again, I, I, I'm a, you know, I was born and raised in Florida. I grew up with the Gemini and the Apollo flights, and I, watch, and I, and I love space. Without a shout out, but I love, and I love the Hubble telescope and the new telescope that they're getting ready to put out because it's going to be more powerful than the Hubble. But still, when you go on the website and you look at the pictures of the Hubble and they're seeing all these galaxies, if you're truly a believer, God created every one of those things. It's baffling to believe. And guess what? As far as any, any telescope can see, God is already there. At the same time, he's here right now. That's something that we have a hard time grasping. You know, I, I mean, I have a hard time. I can, I can say it, but I can't, you know, I can't tell you any more than that. Is that you can go to the furthest galaxy that there is, God is there at that point in time, as much as God is right here right now. So God is a spirit. You know, every time they really talk about God and you see pictures, they don't describe a man on the throne. They describe this light. So, you know, that's another key verse that we saw in Genesis chapter 1. The earth was formless and darkness ruled over the surface of the deep. And the spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the water. And then God said, let there be light. And as you, re as you re continue reading in chapter 1, you find out that light wasn't from the sun. That light wasn't from a moon or stars or anything else because they were created on the fourth day. That was God's light. So now you go back and you read in, in um, Revelation chapter one, um, 21, you're going to find out that the new Jerusalem and the new earth doesn't need light. No, because God is there. And the doors are never closed. The gates won't be shut. You know? Because God's light is already there. And nations will come to God's light. That's why it said, that's why I love in Genesis, in Genesis chapter 1. It says, he looked at light and darkness and he, and he said, it is good for light. He doesn't say it's good for darkness. He says, it's good for light. And we'll get into this a little bit later on. Um, and then also, you know, he created the vegetation, the birds, everything. And then he created man and woman. Now, Genesis chapter 1 says both man and woman. As you go into chapter 2, you'll see how that man and woman were created. Adam from dust, woman from the rib. But still, the key verse in that is they were created in whose image? Image of God. Image of God. And, 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 that, and when they said, when it said create, it says our. Our image. And so you have to sit there, okay, what does the image of God look like? Well, we're not talking about a physical body again. What we're talking about is the attributes of who God is. Love, relationship, honesty, trust, you know, all those things, we're we are created with that. Now, the reason why we don't continue to live in that is because of sin. But you have to understand, when Adam and Eve were first created, they were created fully, completely in the image of God with all those, per with all those um, characteristics. What's going to happen is they also have what God has too, the ability to choose. You know, stop and think about this. God knows everything, right? So when God created um, Lucifer, which we know is Satan, did God know what Lucifer and Satan was going to do? Well, if you believe that God knows all things, period, God knew making a choice. You know, when he created Adam and Eve, 
Did he know again? Go back to Ephesians. It says that, that our names are written in the book of life, which, was, which were, are written before the foundations of the earth. Not only that, but Christ and his mission was known before the creation of the earth. So God knew. Again, remember the big picture thing. This huge movie, not only is he writing the story, but as he sees the whole movie and everything else, he knows every little scene all the way through. He interacts in every one of those scenes. But he knows the beginning and he wrote the beginning and the end. And so when we sit there and you think about this, yes, he had the ability to choose. You know, and you can see where God makes choices, and you can see what appears to us and say, oh, well, we changed God's mind. You don't change God's mind. But when, Mo, when you know, God would say, by golly, I'm going to wipe all these Israelites off the face of the earth. I'm going to keep you Moses, and we'll start again. Moses said, oh, Lord, please don't do this. It's not you. That's right, it's not. He didn't change God's mind. He's allowing Moses to intercede. We talked about last week when um, we was reading the, um, the, um, the prayer in Daniel that, that, that Clay was talking about. That prayer, and we talked about that prayer that Daniel prayed wasn't, look at all those sinful people out there, Lord. It's, hey, me and those people, Lord, are making a mess. Me and whatever else. And we have to associate ourselves with who we really are. And we're, the only difference between us and the person that's not saved is that key word there. They don't have Christ in their life. The only reason I have salvation is because of what Christ did on the cross. And it was a gift given to me because I accepted that gift. Because, and, and even then, God prodded me to accept that gift. And my heart was open enough to be able to accept it. That's the difference between me and the rest of the world. Now, what continues with my life and the rest of the world is I choose, and I love the word that you used earlier, sanctification. I want to do what Peter says, to be holy as he is holy. I want to continue to grow in love. Because I love how in Genesis it talks about he created this new life. Well, you know, that new life got destroyed. And so Paul writes and says, you know, when we accept Christ, we, have a, we are a new creation. We have a new life, and that new life resembles the life that God had, had, had initially started in Adam and Eve. But because the sin was falling all apart. Chapter 2 gets us into a more finite picture. It's not two separate stories. It's just a telescope going a little bit deeper. And that telescope's going to get deeper as you, as you read in Genesis, and I know, we're, you know we'll never get through Genesis, but as you continue to read in Genesis, I challenge you guys to read it. Because what happens is you'll see that scope getting smaller and smaller and smaller to where it boils down to Noah. And then Noah almost serves as Adam and Eve. But yet you're going to find out if you read the story that Noah still makes a mistake. He is getting drunk after, you know, totally, you know, totally living 40 days in on God's provisions and everything else. And then he goes and finds land, grows a garden, garden, and bam, he's back drunk again, making a fool out of himself. That's part of that sin in life. But then it, it focuses on Noah, and then it focuses on Abraham. And the whole key, it goes back to what we're going to see in chapter 3 here, this, this seed. If you want to have a neat study, and, and if I ever get a chance to, te to teach it, is to, uh, is to understand the seed, the timeline of Christ. Because it's, it's prophesied in Genesis chapter 3 that it's coming. And from Genesis chapter 3... Until the time Jesus shows up, and even with the death of Christ, you got to understand from Satan's perspective, he thought he won. You know, understand something about evil and sin, and, we're, and I would love to teach this also, but understand something about evil and sin. The more you get yourself caught up, and, I, and I'm not talking about politics, I don't care, I'm not, I, I don't, I'm not um, bragging on one party over the other party, but if you watch politics in America, we're, bite, we're, we're battling each other with words. Sometimes we get so much hatred that we really can't see the good in anything. Anybody ever see the, the movie, the Christian movie, on um, Fire Storm or Fire? Fireproof. Fireproof. In the movie Fireproof, the key message was there was that the woman, in both the man and the woman, they had these little blinders on so much that all they saw was the bad in each other. They never saw the good. And the pastor was saying, to, and the person was counseling, saying, hey, look, if you would start looking at the good, 
instead of always looking back. But see, the thing about sin, and the thing about getting caught up in hate and everything else, is that it clouds. And so think about Satan. He's in a constant cloud of hatred. He can't even see what's going to happen. You know, he, it just baffles him. But the, but the neat thing is that little seed from Genesis all the way until Christ dies goes all the way through. And it was a promise. It was promised to Abraham. It was pro promised to Isaac. It was promised to Jacob that, hey, this seed, this Messiah that's going to come, is going to come through that side. Judah, one of the, one of the um, sons of, of, of Jacob, he's, he, his seed was going to come out of Judah. And when you can if you ever get a chance, read um, First and Second Kings and, and um, First and Second Chronicles, because you, because you'll see there that there are multiple times when Satan tried to destroy that seed altogether. Mm -hmm. If I can stop that seed, God lied. But even though that seed, you know, I, I, there was one there was one story in, in, in Kings that talks about how the you know all the relatives of David had died. And the reason why I died is because this wife, this queen, she killed them all. But guess what? There was this prophet Joash, and he hid this one little baby away from being killed. Guess what? There's that seed all the way through. And then as you get reading to the rest of First and Second Kings and, and Chronicles, you see that both kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, fall apart. And it looks like all the kings have died, yet there's this one king that's still sitting in prison over in, in, in Babylon, in, in the Persian world, and eventually one of the Persian kings says, brings up out of prison, and say, he sits at the king's table. And then as you, as you read in Matthew chapter 1, you look at the genealogy, you'll see that king, that last king's name, again, it's part of that seed. Satan could not snuff out. He tried his best to snuff out. So, we have the, tr and, and so he, he creates a garden. Now, let me ask a question. Why did God create a garden? I mean, the whole earth was filled, right? I mean, beautiful. Why a garden? Well, what the time? So I mean, man didn't have to do anything. And if he knew that he was going to sin and he's going to cast them out, they got to go to work. <clears throat> if you picture the Garden of Eden the way I do, he just sat there and he ate and he frolicked, he slept, Again. didn't have need for anything. It was utopia, all right? That is opposed to every place else. I mean, every place else is that outside of the garden of Eden. You might have had to done some work. You might have had to walk a mile to get a drink of water. You might have had to walk two miles to get to the local apple orchard. Garden of Eden was not that way. It was perfect. Right? And he was commanded to till and to take That's care right. of the garden. There, there was work. Why else the garden of Eden? What was in the Garden of Eden? Everything plus two trees. There was a tree of life and a, tr and a tree of knowledge of both good and evil. Now it's kind of interesting because you, you have to stop and think yourself. Okay, if Adam and Eve never ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, would they have any knowledge at all? You don't have to look these up. I'm going to give them to you, but you can write these things down. The, the answer to that is yes. Um, in, um, let's see if we can find it real quick. Um, in Proverbs, um, Solomon writes about the tree of life. And let me find that real quick. In Proverbs 3, 13 through 18. He talks about the tree of life is wisdom. Okay, Proverbs. You can let's go ahead and read it. Pro Proverbs chapter three, verses thirteen through eighteen. Somebody look that up. And while somebody's looking that up, look up. Somebody look up Proverbs eleven thirty. Somebody look up Proverbs thirteen twelve, and somebody look up Proverbs fifteen um, four. So Proverbs three. Chapter 13, verses 13 and 18. Somebody have that? All right. Go ahead and read it. Blessed are those who find wisdom, those who gain understanding. For she is more profitable than silver and yields better returns than gold. She was more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand and in her left hand is an honor. Her ways are pleasant ways and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life. Solomon describes 
describes wisdom as being a part of what that tree of life is. Think about it. There's two trees. Tree of life and tree of knowledge of good and evil. And we'll talk a little bit more about this tree of knowledge of good and evil. It wasn't an apple tree, Bobby. But, you know, there's a, but we're going to talk about why that tree there. Okay, but we know one thing about the tree of, uh, of tree of life. It brings wisdom. It provides wisdom. All right, who's got 1130? Proverbs 1130. The fruit of the righteous is the tree of life. And whoever captures the soul is wise. Okay, so the tree of life brings righteousness. Wisdom and righteousness. Th Proverbs 13, 12. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. Okay. So when they're, you know, the tree of life brings about hope and a fulfillment in life. How about um, Proverbs 15, 4? The tongue that brings healing is a tree of life, but a deceitful tongue crushes the spirit. Okay. So the tree of life is learning how to use our tongue. And, and a tongue that's soothing brings life. A tongue that, that curses somebody just you know, destroys. So the tree of life is wisdom. The tree of life is righteousness. The tree of the tree of life is is a hope desire, a fulfillment of that hope desire. A tree of life is a is a soothing tongue that brings encouragement. So we see this, you know, and, and, and then when we get into Revelation chapter two, you know. John's writing, is told to write a letter to seven different churches, and he writes to the church, and I think it's um, um, Smyrna. He says, you know, you guys are persecuted, but you'll be able to eat of the tree of life in paradise. So the tree of life is the first time we see it is in the Garden of Eden, but the tree of life, once the Garden of Eden is closed to man, the tree of life is in paradise. And then as you get into chapter 21 and 22, not only do you see the tree of life one time, but then you see this river that's flowing from the throne of God, crystal clear, <coughs> beautiful. And on that, and on either side of that of that river are the tree of life, and it's bearing fruit every single month. And the fruit and the leaves of that tree bring about healing and comfort and everything. So you know, it's not just one tree. Now we see that tree of life in God's paradise and in God's new heaven and new earth. So it's neat to see this, but now you have to stop and say, okay, so that's what the tree of life is. So why did God put the tree of knowledge of good and evil? Thoughts? Choice. Okay. A choice. Because it's a tree of knowledge of good and evil. Knowledge of what, though? And that's the key piece. Because we already see the tree of life brings wisdom. You know, they would have been wise if they continued on following God's command. They would have had the tree of life, which would have brought the healing, just as it talks about in, in, in Revelation. It would have brought, brought the healing. It would, have, it, you know, it would have brought all the things that the tree of life is. But they had a choice, and that was that knowledge of good and evil. And so what happened is they take that tree, and that's what we're going to look in here in chapter 3. They decide to or disobey. And so God put a, you know, common about a choice. In front of their lives. Will you obey me? Because hey, here's what it says. All the trees you can eat. Including the tree of life. All the trees you can eat. But if you eat of this tree, <coughs> you will surely die. And you need to make sure, that, and, and, and um, this is found in, um, in, in, in Genesis chapter um, 2. Verse uh, 15 and 17. I want to make sure we read this. Then the Lord took man. Okay, first of all, not both of them. God took man and put him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate and to keep it. And the Lord commanded man, saying, From any tree in the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in that day you eat from it, you will surely die. That was the command given to God. And we're going to and you need to pay attention to those words as we get ready to start into um, chapter 3. So let's go ahead and look at and look at chapter 3. Any questions up to this point? Alright. 
It's not very long. It's only 24 verses, but I'm going to read through this verse before we dive into it. Now the Lord, no, excuse me. Now the serpent was more crafty than all the beasts of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, as God said, you shall not eat from any tree in the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees in the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God says, You shall not eat, from, eat it or touch it, or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, Surely you will not die. For God knows that in the days that you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise. She took from its fruit and ate, and then she gave it to her husband, um, who, were, who was with her, and he ate. And then both of them um, and then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together to make themselves loin cloth, clothings, clothing. They, said, they heard the sound of the Lord of God walking through the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord called out to man and said, Where are you? He, Adam replies, He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to eat? And man said, The woman that you gave to me, to, um, she, the woman that you gave to be with me, she gave me um, from the tree, and I ate it. Then the, the Lord said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me. I ate. And God said to the serpent, because, he didn't ask the serpent why, because you have done this, curse are you more than all the cattle, for more than all the beasts of the fields. On your belly you will go, dust you will eat all the days of your life. I will put an enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He will bruise your head, and you will bruise, bruise him on the heel. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply the pain of your childbirth. And in pain you will bring forth children. Yet your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Then to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have, and have eaten from the tree which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles shall grow for you, and you will eat of the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread, um, till you return to the ground because from you you was taken you, you for you were are dust and to dust you will return now a man had called his wife's name Eve because she be, was the mother of all the living and God made garments of skin for both Adam and his wife and clothed them then God said behold man has become like one of us knowing good and evil now he, he might stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, God um, sent him out of the Garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. So he, was, he drove man out, and at, the east of the garden, um, a, a, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he stationed the cherubim with a flaming sword, sword which turned every direction to guard the way back to the tree of life. So I wanted to see this full picture here. If we may not get through it all, but I wanted you to see because this is the story of what happened. This is how sin started. It's because of this. So let's go back because I want to dive into a couple things. Now the serpent. Okay. So first of all, the serpent that we're sitting here talking about was probably not a snake at the time. You know, it didn't crawl on its belly. Don't know exactly what it looks like. I'm not going to get into fictitious. Thoughts and everything else. All I can tell you is that first of all, it says that he didn't crawl him up. That was one of the curses. But the but the serpent, who Satan used, was crafty. And it's interesting to note how he ends up turning that. But first, let's just kind of look at this because and, and, and I'm not going to spend a long time with this. But let's just kind of talk about who is the serpent. A lot of times we talk about Satan. We talk about the devil. You know. And yes, we, and, and I think it's important to know about the devil 
to understand about demons, not to get sidetracked into just totally everything about it. If you understand what I'm saying. Sometimes we can, you know, we can get too deep into a certain subject where it just really is it's not where God wants us to go. Right. It's not, huh? Rabbit hole. Yeah. Wow. Rabbit hole. And, and, the th and the thing is, is that, you know, yes, it's important to see. Now, there's some verses in the Bible, and I want you to look at it, and, and I want to say this up front. There's some verses that we're going to look at in, in Ezekiel and Isaiah. And, you know, and again, I, I apologize every time I teach. You know, I, I do a lot of reading through the Bible. I also um, do a lot of reading out of different commentaries. Because I think God uses those commentaries because there's a lot of people between the time that the church was formed until 2019, a lot of people, a lot of believers have studied the word and they have written things. And I think it's good sometimes just as much as we sit in this room and talk about, hey, what, what are your thoughts about this? People ask what people have done. They have written their thoughts on what they really believe. You know, just as we talk about this timeline here, this is called dispensationalism. You know what another theology thought is? Anybody? You uh, may not. And I'm not going to get bored into it. But another theology thought that kind of helped group scripture is what they call covenant. You know, because what happens if you read the if you read the Bible, God creates covenants with His people, different covenants. We're living in what covenant? Do you think? Have you heard it? It's in written. It's in, it's found in the New Testament. It's also in Hebrew. We're living in a new covenant. You know, it's a new promise. Okay? Now, again, personally, I choose not to get caught up in one theological thought. Because I, like I like to read both. But in my mind, and this is what I like to teach, is that I think it, there's wisdom in all things. Think about this. A Isaac Newton. What, 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 what's the thing that he kind of found? Okay. Did he create gravity? He discovered a law that was already created that God created. The law of centrifugal force. I, the reason why I like this is because I was going to a Billy Graham crusade in Little Egypt before New 16 with a big sharp curve. And I was on a rush in a brand new vehicle that I bought for my wife. And we, I was in a rush to get down there because I was running late and I hit that curve way too fast. And I knocked out a couple pine trees and totaled that car. Thank goodness, God. <laughs> <laughs> but, the, but the law of centrifugal force is a true law, you know. Somebody might discover. You read these. If you go in, if anybody, if you've been in college and you study psychology, you read about Pablo's monkeys and everything else, and they'll and they'll talk about all these things. These are discoveries about love and relationships and everything else. But guess what? They're not wrong. But they're finding out something that God had already created. You know? So, you know, I love what Solomon writes in Ecclesiastes. There's nothing new underneath the sun. You know, period. And so, yes, we have these different theological thoughts. You know, we have these different denominations that, are, that kind of build themselves upon different theological <coughs> thoughts. And I like to and I can't, and I, and I don't even want to try to try to guess what theological thought Jordan comes from. But honestly, in my mind, when I listen to Jordan, I don't see him going down one certain path or the other. I just like the idea that I just want to read Scripture. Yeah. You know, it's good to understand yeah. all that stuff, but it's really important just to see the Word of God and just let the Holy Spirit teach you. And so what's happening here is that, in how I got to this point, is that you're, we're going to look at two verses in Ezekiel and Isaiah and there's some theologian that says, well, that's really talking about the person that that prophet was talking about and not so much Satan. But we'll sit and look at it and see. Let's turn to, um, first, let's, let's all turn to Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 12 through So handy dandy electronic Bible, so it's before it's a, it's after Lamentations and it's right before Daniel. Trust me, there's been years I've been. I'm, okay, 
Where's Ezekiel? Where's Ezekiel? Okay, table of contents. What page number is it? All right. So anyway, Ezekiel 28, verse 12 through 19. Let's read it. Okay, so Ezekiel is talking. God's telling him, I want you to speak to the king of Tyre. Okay, so that's where, the, that's where chapter 28 first starts up. Is that, you know, I want you to say this to the king of Tyre. And so, you know, the first um, 1 through 12 verses, or 1 through 11, is, you know, God is, or um, Ezekiel is talking to what God has said to tell this king. But then he, then he goes back in here and starting on, 12, on um, verse 12. Son of man, take up laments, lamentation over the king of Tyre and say to him, thus says the Lord, for you had the seal of perfection, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. Ruby, topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the lispin and zeal, the turquoise and the emerald and the um, emerald and gold and workmanship of your settings and sockets was in you. On that day that you were created, they were prepared. You were the anointed cherub who, who covers, and I placed you there. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked in the midst of the fiery stones. You were blameless in all your ways from the day you were created until unrighteous, until unrighteous was found in you. By abundance of your trade, you were initially filled with violence and you sinned. Therefore, I cast, I cast you as profane from the mountain of God. And I have destroyed you, O covering, um, covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was filled up because of your beauty. You, corrupt, your, you corrupted your wisdom by reason of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I put you before kings that they may see you. And by the multitude of your iniquities and the unrighteousness of your trade, you profaned your, your sanctuaries. And therefore I brought fire from the midst of you. It has consumed you. And I have turned you into ashes of the earth in the eyes of all who see. All who know you among the peoples are, are appalled at you. And you are become terrified. You will cease to be, and you will cease to be forever. So you sit there and you read this and you go, okay, now this is kind of weird because he's talking to a king. But the king wasn't in the Garden of Eden. You know, the king wasn't really a cherub. Who knows what a cherub is, real quick? Huh? It was an angel, but kind of an angel. A protective angel. Right. If you read in Revelations, well, there's plenty. You can read in Isaiah, you can read in Revelations, but in Revelations, John's seen the throne of God, and there's these four cherubim, okay? They have multiple wings, they have eyes on them. I mean, it's really kind of wild. But, they, you know, a head of an eagle, a head of a cow, a head of a man. And, and so, you know, you see these huge beings that you know, protect the throne of God in a sense. When you look, if you ever see a picture of the, um, I think it's the ark in the mercy seat, there's these two cherubims that are sitting protecting that seat, okay? And that's that same picture that you see in Revelation. So these were the protective angels. They're different than the other angels. You know, you know who is it that protects the, 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 the um, tribe of Israel in the Old Testament? Are you mind up? It's Michael. Michael. Who is the angel that proclaimed the birth of Christ? Gabriel. So those are, you know, they weren't cherubims. They're other types of angels, okay? So, you know, you know, people will say, oh, hey, did God, is there aliens? I'm not aliens, but I'll tell you one thing. God created man. He also created angels. Right. And, and guess what? Those angels also had, guess what they had? The freedom to choose. Let's, um, real quick, turn to Revelations um, chapter 12. Because this is, a, I mean, this is an interesting chapter in itself. Because in the midst of Revelation, and you're going through the seals, and you're going through the trumpets, and you're getting ready to go into the bowls, and you know, all of a sudden, right in the middle of everything, there's this one little story. And it's kind of like a history lesson. But it's interesting. It says a great sign appeared in heaven, and a woman clothed with the sun and the moon underneath her feet, and her head was a crown of twelve stars. And she was with child, and she cried out, being in labor and in pain to give birth. And where did that pain come from? You'll find out. Then another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon. 
having the seven heads and ten horns, and, and on his head were seven dinghams, or also crowns. And his tail swept away one-third of the stars in heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she gave birth, he might devour the child. Just remember what I was telling you about as you, as you read from Genesis to uh, the time of Christ died, Satan was there trying to devour that child. He didn't want that child to come. That's Jesus. Okay, so going down to um, verse 7. And there was a war in heaven, and Michael and his angels were raging war with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels were at war. And they were not strong enough, and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that serpent of old, who is called the devil, and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. So, a real quick picture. Now, what I, I can't tell you, it's not in Scripture, so I'm not going I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna guess at this. But when, did, when were angels created and when did they um, fall? I don't know. Period. I do know this. Based upon what we've seen in Ezekiel, that Satan was a mighty um, angel. He was perfection. And I've heard, one, I've heard um, one teacher teach that he was almost like the prototype of all angels. You know? But because of his wisdom, because of his beauty and everything else, he allowed that to get into his head, and because of that, he sinned against God. And we'll, and we'll see that sin here in a minute when we read Isaiah. He was a worship leader. Huh? He was a yeah. Worship leader. I've heard that talk. I've heard that talk. Because he was music. You know, music's not bad, folks. But God can, but God can use music, and Satan can use music. You know, but so here we are. So we see here in Revelation a kind of little brief history of what happened. Satan took one third of the angels. In Revelation, it's calling them stars, but one third of the angels with him, and they were cast out of heaven and on the earth. Now, as you continue to read Revelation, you'll find out that some of those angels are locked up in a pit, not to be released at all. If you re if you go back and you read through the Gospels, you'll see how God in how Jesus interacts with some of those angels, also called what demons, you know, and and how you know it's like you know when. Um, there was all these people, and there was a man who was just running around naked and everything else. And he said, oh, don't, don't put us, don't put us, cast us away too soon, you know. And he said, well, get those pigs in. And they all just ran off, you know. So, you know, we, you know there's a good teaching, and I'm not going to get deep into it today. There's a lot of good teaching to understand about Satan and about demons. But we have to first understand they're real. You know, it's not a fairy tale. You know, just as, um, as, as when we study the Ephesians, for those who are over here, when we went through the book of Ephesians, and you go into chapter 6, Paul writes to, do, to suit up with what? The whole armor of God. Why? <laughs> well, because of the fiery darts. Not because of man. <coughs> Not because of creation that God created, you know, the man and women. It's because of the evil, the principalities. The things, those fiery darts that, God's going to, that Satan is in his sport. Now, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a key proponent of saying, you know, I mean, if you remember Flip Wilson, for those who are older, his little favorite line was what? The devil never do. The devil never do. But guess what? I'm going to tell you something. The devil is a being, period. He's not God. He can't be here and there at the same time. Yes, he was full of wisdom. Is he a smart angel? Yes. Is he still a smart angel? Yeah. Yes. You know, it's not a force to be taken. Okay, you read in Jude. I love reading in Jude. You, Jude, Jude was talking about how um, Michael was, they were kind of you know, having this discussion about Moses' body. Yeah. You know, and it says that even Michael didn't rebuke Satan. He said, by the Lord. You know, he used God as his defender mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So you have to understand that Satan is just a being, a powerful being, but he can't be everywhere. He can't tempt every one of us. So he has one-third of his angels with them, and one-third of those angels with him are the ones or the demons that he orchestrates. And that power of principalities is the ones that attack us. Now, as Jordan has also taught, and you remember some of, some of this, are, you know, a lot of times some of the things that we get ourselves caught into have nothing to do with Satan at all. It has to do with just our simple lusts and desires and everything else, as, you're, as we're going to get ready to see here, uh, how, at, how um, Eve got so deceived. 
Because sometimes it has nothing to do with Satan doing anything or his forces doing anything. It has to do with our own greed and our selfishness and, our, and the bad choices we make. Let's go to um, um, Isaiah. Um, chapter 14, verses 12 through 15. What chapter? Chapter 14. <coughs> Again, you know, as you as you read this, you know, this is um, you know Isaiah talking about the different rulers and stuff like that. But down here in verse 12, he starts off. How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, the sun of dawn. You have been cut down to the earth. You have weakened the nations. You said in your heart, now keep, keep, you pay attention to this. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mountain of the assembly in the recess of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most holy. Okay? So, a lot of theologians believe that this that these verses here are also talking about Satan. And that wisdom, that, as we saw, that, you know, that corrupted his mind that Ezekiel was talking about. And these five I wills. And I love the key pieces because the last I will is what? I will make myself like the most high. So let's go back to Genesis chapter 3. Because you'll see how all this fits together. So Satan's talking to the woman, the serpent. She, she do not know who Satan is. She sees the serpent talking. The serpent's talking at that time. Apparently so they communicate. Adam named all the animals. You know, I don't know what creation was totally like. Apparently one thing for sure, it wasn't the fear of man. We find out that fear of man and animals didn't happen until after the flood. So there wasn't that fear of man that, that we see today in animals and stuff like that. We know, we know that, the, that the serpent itself wasn't exactly um, a snake at the time. So, but, you know, but the serpent is saying to the woman, Indeed, has God said, you should not eat from any tree in the garden? Now, where did, where did that serpent, what did that devil just do? Put it down. Well, put it down. He, he put it down, huh? He, how did he lie? Misquoted God. Yeah, he misquoted. Now again, and, we, and, and, and and I wish I had time, but we don't. We go back to uh, Matthew and uh, also in um, in um, Luke, and it talks about the temptations of Christ with Satan. Satan goes up to and Satan goes up to Jesus and tempts him, and he says, you know, hey, you can turn these rocks into bread. And what does Jesus do? He quotes, he quotes out of scripture out of Deuteronomy. He says, you know, you know, bread comes from God. You know, I don't need this. You know, hey, he even quotes out of Psalm. He says, take yourself up to a high pinnacle and throw yourself off. And God says that he'll send his angels down and pick you up so you don't dash your feet against the stones. Kind of a little misinterpretation there. But again, Jesus said no. Now see, that's a key piece. The difference between Adam and Eve and Jesus. And that's why Jesus was the perfect man, because he went through the same temptations. The Hebrew the writer of Hebrew says, he went through all the same temptations that we face today. You know, he went through all the troubles. God knows our troubles. He knew our troubles before Jesus showed up. Promise me that. But one of my favorite verses in, um, and I have a lot of favorite verses, but one of my favorite verses is found in Matthew, and we read it, and we probably even know it, Matthew um, 634, 633. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness. Yeah. Now, how many know that, how many has ever read the 34th verse? It says, hey, look, troubles are going to happen. I'm just paraphrasing. Troubles are going to happen. I know troubles are going to happen. You know, this is God speaking. Yeah, we need to seek God first because God's going to take care of things. But hey, listen, that doesn't necessarily mean you're not going to face troubles. And so Jesus said, you're going to face troubles. God knew our troubles. And so, he said, he, so Satan here goes here. He says, shall you eat from any tree in the garden? No, what was the command? 
You should not eat of one tree, the knowledge of good and evil. Now watch what else he says. Now the woman says to the serpent, and I love this, she goes, from the, tr from the fruit of the trees in the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree that's in the middle of the garden, um, God said you should not eat from it or touch it or you will die. Now what did Eve do? Yeah, she misquoted. You know, that's why it's important to know our, our, the scripture of God. And we're all, and I'm just as guilty as, as, as Eve is. I'm not going to point a finger. I always told you this. If I point one finger at one person, there's three fingers pointing back at me. You know, we all are, have a tendency to misuse or, or misquote, even innocently, as I'm sure what Eve was doing, to misquote what God's word is saying. But that's not what God's word said. That's not what God commanded now the woman down here, you get this. Now the woman, now the serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die, for God knows that in the day that you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like what? Be like God. What was the I wills? The last I will? Now think about this. This is like the root of all sin. You know, I mean, and you probably heard this before. Sin is spelled how? S-I-N. You know, I's in the middle of everything of sin. It's always about me, you know? And the, and the desire to be like God is a desire, that sinful desire has always been through mankind, even to today. We want to take the place of God. We want to be the ones that can that make our own decisions. We don't want to recognize our God, so we'll say we're atheists. Or we'll say, hey, yeah, I think there's a God, so I'm an agnostic. Or, you know, or, hey, Jesus was just another angel, a real powerful angel, and we're all going to be like guys like Jesus, like the Mormons. That's wrong. There's God, and then there's the creation. Angels, beasts, fish, birds, the only difference between man and and the rest of the beasts and everything else that was created on earth is God breathed into us. We were created in his image. We have the mind to be able to recognize who God is. The earth groans. We stay, remember when we studied 1 Corinthians? The earth groans for the day when God's rule will be on earth. That's what, you know, we're getting here towards the millennium kingdom. The earth groans for that because the earth was built and created to be perfect. And now because of sin, as we, as, we, as we read here, now he's, you know, the earth is just turning into thorns and thistles. And this just didn't happen overnight, by the way, folks. It didn't rain on earth until when? Noah. Yeah. So think about that. And if, you were, and if you want to have a fun time, do a little timeline and just write down so-and-so lived this many years, so-and-so -so -and -so lived this many years. There was this one guy named Methuselah. He lived the longest of all the years. You know, and some people, well, you know, that person can't live 900 years. Hey, I told you, this is when we talk to, when we were talking about Genesis chapter 1. If God said it was a day and morning, and that word for day in Hebrew means 24-hour period, I believe that God created things in one single day. Could there be the possibility that God, as, as, as Peter writes, a, a day in the Lord is like a thousand years? I'm not going to argue that. But I have firm belief. A firm belief that, hey, if God said it's going to happen, on, and it does happen on one day, he can do it in one day. That's the power of my God. Amen. You know, and if you don't have, if you don't understand the power of God in your life, you're missing out. Because it's, a, it's that power that lives with inside of us through his Holy Spirit that we can stand against. And we can live a life that's a new life in Christ. And not one that's, that's totally dictated by our own desires. And so anyway, you know, you can be you can be like God, knowing good and evil. Now watch what happens. This, this is perfect sin. You know, this is what sin's all about. What does a woman do? Oh, she saw that the tree was good for food. Hey, looks pretty neat. Yeah. And that it was delight to the eyes. And that the tree was desirable to make one wise. Think about this. She thought God was hiding out something. Yeah, he created us and he gives us everything else, but he's holding back on us. 
You know, hey, God, there's something more in life, and you're just holding back. You're being a meanie. You know? Oh, you can make one wise. And she took the fruit and ate it. And then when we're talking about something, and then she gave it to her husband. We'll talk about that in a second. But did you see that pattern there? You know, sin in itself is probably, and, and, I, and I really want, hope that sometime I get, I get a chance just so we can talk about what sin really is and everything else. The, the key piece here, sin is not evil when you really think about it. It's, hey, it looks good. If it looked terrible and everything else, we probably wouldn't touch it. You know, if I saw sin as a rattlesnake, and I know a rattlesnake is going to bite me and, and, and could possibly kill me, I ain't going to sit there and play with snakes. I ain't definitely going to play with a rattlesnake. You know, but that's not sin. See, what happens is we take those desires, just like James was talking about is that lust, is that desire in our lives. In chapter 1 of James, it says, she, think about this. She saw that the fruit was good. It was pleasing to the eyes. Oh, and God was holding something back. You know, oh, God, you, you, you created this. Why didn't you like us to be wise? You know, what is this? As we ever saw, the tree of life brought wisdom. Hey, we still think, hey, God's holding back on us. And so she ate it. And that's that same desire that we all have in our lives. We look at something, and we realize it's wrong, but hey, it's kind of, looks like, all right. Or we, or we tend to think, and I'm getting, I won't go too far, but we tend to classify sin. How many speed? Okay, do you know what God says in his word that we should not break the laws of man? I'm number one here. I'm not pointing fingers. There's ten fingers pointing. You know? But how many of us says in the, it, it says, Paul writes, that we should be holy, that we should be keep our thoughts pure. Now I'm not going to talk about getting, you know, hopefully nobody in this room is caught up in pornography. But you watch a PG-13 movie? You know? What songs are you listening to? What do you watch on TV and, and regular TV shows? And again, I'm not going to go into what's right and what's wrong. That's a decision between you and God. But you've got to stop and think. The things that pride does not please God, we're looking at and we go, yeah, I know, God, this pride doesn't please you, but man, I really do want to watch this movie. Oh, Lord, I really do like this TV program. It's just and normal all by, Huh? It's just a normal now. Yeah, and oh, by, and oh, by the way, most TV programs are has at least premarital sex involved in it. At the least. You know? At least. At the very least. You know? And oh, I don't know about it, but we'll sit and we'll watch it, and we'll cringe at it, you know? You know, I, 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 I'm, I'm guilty. I'm guilty. So don't, don't sit here and say, oh, Marty's got it made. Uh-uh. You know? But I go to a movie, and all of a sudden I hear the Lord's name taken in vain. And does it crush your spirit, or do you just kind of, well, no more. I know. If you ever, how many people are from the north? Because I don't want to talk bad about you. But, <laughs> you can talk bad about me. But listen, I, I, I never really experienced the north until I got a job in Big Power, and then I had to drive a truck up to New York. And I walked into this GE factory, in New, and it's connected in New York. And I cannot tell you how many times people were using the F word, and it was just like rolling. Yeah. Oh, it was just like. It was like common language, you know, and here I was from the Bible Belt of the South, all the way down in the South, Lord, in, in the Florida, which is a southern state, by the way, you know, but, you know, so here I am from the Bible Belt and everything else, and yes, I used to cuss also, but I didn't cuss like a saint, like, I mean, but those people, and it's just like, you know, it was just rolling off their mouth, but yeah, and I don't know, maybe you guys also, maybe you use a, a few words, I know that sometimes I still do it, and I don't, I don't try not to. I don't cuss as much as I used to. But still, does it cringe when you hear the Lord's name taken in vain mm -hmm. in a movie or something like that? And but you, you know, and then you have to ask yourself and think. Okay, cringe, I didn't like that. But what, what what's the just here's my justification. I don't know what your justification. I'm strong enough in the Lord, okay, I can handle this. You know, I can, you know, i I can push it off the side. But guess what? Our brain, and I'm a I'm an IT tech person, our brain is more powerful than any. 
hard drive man could ever create. And it can, it can remember a ton of things. Mm -hmm. And trust me, just as it said that, hey, you shouldn't be underneath the yoke, you know, that really means that, hey, you, you constantly live around and live around and live around. Guess what? Those things just seem so acceptable. You know, everybody speaks. What's, how fast can you go above the speed limit? Nine. Yeah, nine. <laughs> Nine's pushing it. Definitely five, right? We all know that. A nickel's nothing, man. Fiver's no problem. Yeah. We know the that. Nine, man. You know, because we know that, hey, the, the law won't really pull us over. You know, our, our speedometers may be off a few miles. You know, there's all these justifications and everything else. If not breaking the law, you get caught. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and then when you get caught, but, but I, didn't, oh, I didn't want to watch my speedometer, officer. But still, you know, we see sin. And it looks delightful. Yes, oh, I really want to get somewhere. And you know, there's a study, you know, I remember when it used to be 55 miles an hour all across the nation, and it's like, oh man, you know, if I can just go 65, I get there a few minutes faster. That's just a few minutes faster. It's not like hours faster. You know, it was only a few minutes. But see, in our minds, we justify things. And that's what our Eve was doing. She was justifying all this stuff. It looked good. It was pleasing to the sight. It wasn't ugly looking. You know, and oh, maybe God just doesn't want the best for me. Maybe I, I, I need to take my own destiny. And what was the key phrase there? You will be like God. The very same thing that Satan got cast out of, out of heaven for is the same thing he continues to tempt mankind with. Oh, you can be like God. But now, okay, so we can point a finger at Eve and we can say, oh yeah, Eve did this, you know, blah, blah. what happened? Where was man? Standing right there. Yeah. And she gave it to her husband, um, who, who uh, gave it to her husband with her, and he ate. Now this is an interesting little point. One, he was standing there. Who did God give the command to? Yeah. Yeah. This was before woman was created. If you read chapter two. This is before woman was created. So God already had given the command to man. You know, he could have stood up and said, hey, no, this is a command from God. We're not going to do this. But he didn't. And he told Eve, too. Huh? He told Eve, too. Yeah. But still, said, man, I mean, and, and, and this is why I think it's so important for us as a men's Bible study. Because, guys, we have a responsibility to our wives, to our children. I'm getting ready to be a granddaddy here pretty soon. Don't give me any day. I'm kind of looking forward to it. But you know, we have a responsibility. John and I are blessed to work with students. I love that. that God has given us the opportunity to work with students. A lot of those students don't have a Christian mom and dad. But yet God saw fit to bring that person into our student ministry. You know, there's a lot of young adults, there's a lot, a lot of young marrieds that are out there that are just having babies. And guess what, guys? We can be that mentor, that support for other people in our church who need it. You know? Brother. And, and be the, yeah, and be the example. <laughs> Stand up. You know? Man was with her, and he stayed quiet. Not only did he stay quiet, but he ate. Now, I love this part. And what time is it? Oh gosh, I'm, I'm gosh, I knew I was going to run out of time. But get get a chance because the key piece is the, the fun part about this is the blame game. Exactly. You know, it rolls right up. It rolls so up. The last guy holds the snake. Anytime you get you get caught in something, yeah. I didn't see that sign. You know, it was it, really? It was did it say forty five? I thought it said you know. My wife was talking to me. Yeah. <laughs> I was on the phone when I was texting. But, you do. But, no, but still, look at the blame game because we got close. Look at the blame because I want to honor our time.